Good morning. Good morning. Beautiful day, sunshine. Man, just want you to want to stretch. Or actually want you to lay down and take a good nap with the rain hitting the metal roof somewhere. If you would, stand with us this morning. We are glad to have every one of you with us. If you are visiting, I want to encourage you to find that card in front of you. Uh, get some information so we can reach out to you later, but we want to welcome you to Three Creeks Baptist Church this morning. So if you would, look around you, find that person you hadn't talked to this morning and make them feel welcome. <coughs> come forward this morning for our morning offering i want to uh just encourage you about that song what does it say comes in your soul after jesus comes in your heart floods of joy let's pray lord we just thanks so much just for the opportunity to come to your house lord Thanks so much just for all your many blessings you've bestowed upon each and every one of us, Lord, and how you've blessed this church through the years, Lord, and the, and the blessings to come, Lord. Just help us to accept them, look for them, Lord. 
ask you to just be at the service this morning, Dora, just be at the, the music, Dora, and Brother, be Brother Rossi, present your word, Dora. Let us open our, our eyes and our hearts, the eyes of our hearts to, to see you, Dora. Lord, just help us to perceive it, Dora. Lord, just be at this offering, Dora, and just let it be all done and, and honor and glorify you, Dora. And thank you again for just living in a free country, and thank you so much for your son, Jesus Christ. In your name pray, amen. The first church I pastored was Hilltop Baptist in Fort Worth, Texas. It was a small church, a, a lot like this one. They voted me in seven to zero, a unanimous call. In fact, it's the only unanimous call I've ever received. God taught me a lot about ministry through that church, and it is there that I saw firsthand the sacrificial giving of his people. One of our sweet members was Lenny Fenton. She was an older lady of very little means. She lived in a small house across the street from the church. Some would even call it a shack. Lenny didn't have much, but she gave sacrificially to our little church and to the offerings we participated in. And she took great joy in giving. She counted it a great privilege to give. Lenny has been with the Lord now for many years, but I take her memory with me wherever I'm serving. I tell her story to our staff and remind myself to look at every dollar we receive like it's Lenny Fenton's dollar. You see, when you give to the Annie Armstrong Easter offering, we know that many in your church are giving sacrificially. I also know that there are also dozens of worthy ministries and other things that you could support as a church. So I'm grateful for all that you and your church members do to support the Annie offering. <laughs> Half of what we receive to support our missionaries comes from the Annie offering. And our guidelines require that every penny, every penny of it goes to missionaries and to support them on the field. So whether your church meets in a building similar to this one or if it's in a much larger facility or somewhere in between, we will be the very best stewards of everything you send. Thank you for what you give to the Annie Armstrong Easter offering and for all you're doing to help reach North America for Christ. We are grateful to be your partner. We indeed, indeed do want to emphasize the importance of North American missions, and that's the director of our North American Mission Board that you just heard from. As you see in your order of service, our goal is $2,500, and so this is the Easter offering. We have some Sundays to prepare for our giving. We encourage you to do that because it makes a difference in our world. I want to say to our worshipers today, a, a welcome. Thank you for springing forward. Uh, when I left this morning, having coming down here, I thought, well, it's going to look a little more sparse in the parking lot than it normally does. But boy, there were a lot of cars and trucks out there, and that warmed my heart, excited me. So I'm glad that you're here. I know probably some who may not have made it because of the springing forward, but uh, we'll catch up in a few days. If you're like me, it takes me about a week to catch up. I want to say to our guests today, thank you for coming and being with us. Uh, we encourage you to find a guest card in front of you in the pew and to fill that out and give it to one of us at the close of the service uh, that we may know of your being with us today. We want to be a house of prayer, and uh, in a moment later in the service, we're going to have a time of prayer, especially for our revival coming up. So we'll, I'll be back up here to mention that a little later. I uh, just want you to say thank you for... I uh, want to say to you, thank you for being here, and may God uh, fill us with his strength. Lord, we pray that right now. Will you, Lord, continue as we have sung about the joy of being your follower? Help us, Lord, to really personalize that in our singing and in our worship rather than just repeating words. We pray you may draw us, Lord, uh, into your heart and your hope for us. And we pray, Father, that we may praise your name with genuine hearts and that we will follow with obedience to whatever you say to us today. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.
If you would, go ahead and stand with us as we continue to worship this morning. I'm forgiven because you were forsaken. I'm accepted. You were condemned. before we go to that next song this morning. Lord, we just come to you this morning. We just lift you up. Lord, I just pray that uh, that we understand, Lord, everything you have done for us. And Lord, I pray that we can uh, we can fall before you, Lord, and we can bring everything that's in our life, the troubles that we go through, Lord, our, our hard times, our anger, our... May it be a, something in our family, Lord, that we're having problems with, Lord, that we can bring that before you this morning. Uh, Lord, I just want to lift up those to you this morning that are in need, Lord, whatever the case may be. Lord, I know that you're aware of those that are hurting, Lord, and I just um, I want to lift those people up to you this morning, Lord, as we continue to worship. In your name we pray. <clears throat> worship and bow down before the Lord most holy before the King of glory come and lay your burdens down before the friend who's faithful before the one who's able for he is our God 
just a few weeks, April 8th exactly, will be a time of our revival. April 8th through 11, unless the Holy Spirit asked us to extend that farther. But uh, that's what we're looking at right now, April 8th through 11. And uh, Scott is coming, uh, who came and, and led our uh, hunter's banquet, Scott Taylor. And we so much look forward to him coming back. We're still looking for our worship leaders and uh, we'll be looking forward to having these uh, fresh voices and sp fresh perspective uh, come on April 8th. But nothing happens spiritually without prayer. And so we want to take this time, and we will take the time these Sunday mornings, to pray specifically that God will work in our hearts and God will work in those who once were among us and not actively right now. And God will work among those and begin to give a hunger in our area, in our region, for something that they don't have and nothing else will fill. And that is Christ. That is hope. Now I'm going to just turn in a moment and just bow uh, here at this step. And I invite others who might wish to come and join me either here or at these uh, pews. When we do that, I want you to come if the Lord so leads. You certainly can pray where you are. But in something so important as asking the Lord to give us strength for the future as a church and individually and as moms and dads and grandparents in our families, revival, uh, we want to take special time and have a special posture of kneeling. You might want to just kneel where you are. You can do that. Or you might want to come join me. We're going to do this every week. And as we have this time of prayer, I'm going to have a time of silence. And I'm going to invite anybody in the house, whether you're here or where you are, to pray before I do. I'm just going to give the closing prayer. It may be the only prayer today. But I'm going to invite you to pray aloud. Call out to the Lord. For his strength. Let's bow our heads. You come forward as the Lord may lead you. We're going to pray that God will so work. is not just for an event our prayer Lord is not just for special times of worship our prayer O oh God is not just for something done before it is not just to hear a fresh voice and preaching and fresh voices and singing we look forward to those Lord we thank you for them. But our prayer, O oh Lord, is that we will humble ourselves. That we, even as we prepare for this revival, Lord, will begin searching our hearts perhaps more deeply than we have in recent days. That we may again know the joy of walking in the Spirit. That that may not just be uh, an idle slogan with us. That we again may be refreshed and be strong for your purposes. We who as believers, yes, even in southern Arkansas, yes, even rural Arkansas, still stand alone. In many ways, we are the minority. But what you have done for us is real. It is real as our heartbeat, as our breath. We pray it may be more real for us. We pray, Lord, that those who once were with us but have found other pursuits... They may not be born again, Lord, but they may be. 
But we pray, Father, in having this event, it may be a time not only to draw us, but to draw those we love. Some of them are family members, others just neighbors. And we would pray between now and then that all the other idolatrous pursuits that sometimes creep into our homes and also have become ruler in many homes of people we love, they may be seen as idols that cannot ever deeply refresh. They're cisterns that hold no water. They at first draw us with their hope, but they drain out and leave us dry. Oh, come, Lord Jesus. Come, Spirit of God. Come, God of all. We cannot be your church. Not really. Unless we are humbled. And unless we are united. May that be for your sake. In Jesus' name. Amen. Love, Lord.
we just come to you this morning, Lord. We just want to lift you up, Lord. Worthy is the Lamb this morning, Lord. And I just uh, thank you again for what you've done for us. I pray that you be with Brother Ross as he comes this morning and uh, allow him to, to deliver the words you've laid upon his heart. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, I certainly need to say a word of thanks to Bubba for filling in for me last Sunday morning, and I appreciate that so much. Is my mic on? Am I working? I guess it is. All right, it's working, okay. And I, I do thank you, Bubba, for filling in for me uh, now twice in recent days, and much appreciated. Many people have asked, and I should have mentioned earlier about Sandy. She is doing well. She did have a very significant uh, spike in blood pressure last week. Um, this has been about a year since the previous time that happened, but it was uh, serious for a moment. Uh, fortunately, we were able to get medical help, and uh, now she's on a maintenance kind of drug that should help that happen in the future. So thank you for asking. She will appreciate that, and I thank you for asking as well. Bubba, later on, uh, when we finish, we'll come and share some things we need to know about. But let me emphasize something uh, that is going on at uh, 2.30 today and uh, the coming Sundays that actually Bubba began. I appreciate him for that. By Jim Cimbala, When God's People Pray, a uh, six-session study. It was a pretty good turnout for 2.30 last week. And uh, so I'm, I'm going to be part of that, try to be part of that each week that I can. And uh, I encourage you. I encourage you. I know that's pretty soon. That's nap time for some of us, but uh, maybe if the Lord leads, you might come and be with us because Jim Cimbala is a, a powerful, he's anointed of the Lord. He's not powerful of himself, but he is anointed of the Lord, friends, and he has some important things to tell us. All right. Mark chapter 10, verses 32 through 45. Mark chapter 10, verses 32 through 45. And if you're getting some deja vu and say, wait a minute, that, that sounds like something four weeks ago, a passage, you, you'll be right. Four weeks ago, I preached out of that. I'm coming at it from a little different angle today, but you'll see as we read uh, that it is a familiar passage to those of us who are here then. And let me invite you to stand for the reading of God's Word. You found that Mark chapter 10, beginning with verse 32. Mark writes that they, that is, Jesus and his disciples and all who were following, it was still a, a large group of people, and they there, they were on their way up to Jerusalem with Jesus leading the way. And the disciples were astonished while those who, were, who followed were afraid. Again, he took the twelve aside and told them what, he was going, what was going to happen to him. We are going up to Jerusalem, he said, and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles who will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him. Three days later, he will rise. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. By the way, the Lord had taught them earlier, whatever you want, ask of me. So they were just being obedient to that. Verse 36 what do you want me to do for you, he asked. They replied, let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in your glory. You don't know what you are asking, Jesus said. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? Talking about the cross. Talking about death for the sake of righteousness. We can, they answered. Your Bible may say we are able, which is a good translation. Drink the cup I drink and be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with. Not all of them going to the cross, but all of them sooner or later dying for the sake of his name. Verse 40. But to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared. When the ten heard about it, that is the ten other disciples, they became indignant with James and John. Jesus called them together and said, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. It will not be that way with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. 
For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Thank you and be seated. And may God bless just the reading of his word as we're called to do in worship. Well, it's almost gardening season. I'm a gardener. I love gardening. I don't know how much I'll be able to do long-distance gardening this time. But gardening season starts getting me pumped up because there's nothing like watching a seed. You plant this little seed. You know, maybe it's uh, uh, bush beans, and it's just a little seed. And you try not to drop too many in one hole. They're so small. And then after a while, that thing grows into a beautiful, mature uh, seed-bearing, not only seed-bearing, but fruit-bearing plant. And the transformation, you know, you can see it year after year. It's still so exciting to watch. Wow, we're going to have fun harvesting all that. Usually Sandy is the one who harvests this. You know, she says, you know, you plant, I harvest. And she didn't used to like that, but she's now kind of gotten used to it. Uh, she goes out daily, and I'll help her when I can. But that's kind of her job. But it's fun to see what God does with a seed. Fruit-bearing growth. To a certain extent, we are a kingdom impact church. But hear that, please. But if we want to be a greater kingdom impact church, the way to do so is to help our existing leaders go stronger in what they do. And not only that, but also to call out and train new leaders. Whether we see the need for that or not. Say, preacher, this sounds like uh, what you talked about four weeks ago. You're right. I'm still talking about leadership. Still talking about leadership. Whether we see the need or not, a lot of times we say, along about time the nominating committee is working, oh my goodness, we've got all these slots to fill. But when they finish doing it, praise the Lord, we say we no longer have any slots to fill. And that's the kind of the, the way we look at raising new leaders. What's the need if we have all our slots filled? Well, that's not walking by faith. That's not the way the, the Lord wants us to lead. We need. do walk by faith. It is walking by faith because we can say, well, there's no need to raise up a new leader right now. But when we do raise up a new leader, the Lord will provide a place. And it will be a strategic place, a place that we need to have that particular person fill. And so hear me now, we need to help existing leaders. I'm an existing leader. I need help. I'll never get to the place where I don't need to be strengthened. I'll never get to the place where I don't need you to pray for me. And I can't learn new things in better ways. And also call out and train new leaders. See, the Holy Spirit, we read Acts chapter 2 and we, Acts chapter 6, I mean. We read Acts chapter 6 and we, we understand that's kind of the deacon passage. And uh, the Lord said to the apostles that time to tell the church, look out among you and choose these men who are going to be worthy of this service because I'll, uh, you look for spirit-filled men, by the way, when you look for deacons, not just people, but spirit-filled men. Well, I believe the Holy Spirit is still saying to us, look out among you. Keep on looking out among you. For those who have a role already to bless them, to strengthen them in any way they may need encouragement or, or some better tools or some refreshed training. But also keep on looking out among you for those people who would love to be involved, but no one has come to them and asked them to have a role. Ephesians chapter 4, you may be familiar, especially verses 12 and following, talk about how it starts with a pastor, but it goes on down. We need to be equipping the saints, equipping them, giving them strength, helping to call them out. And the reason that we equip the saints for the work of ministry is so that the body of Christ will be strengthened, built up. I love the way Paul says that. We'll keep on being built up. We need to keep on being even those moments we say, man, it cannot get any better. We still need to keep on being built up, especially in unity and in service to the Lord. And that happens not just by 
strengthening leaders, but that must be a part of it. See, churches that don't intentionally equip their leaders will eventually die. You can write that down. If we just say, well, we called that leader out 20 years ago, hope she's doing well. If we don't intentionally do something, not all the time, there's a lot of other things we need to do, but if, not, if a part of what we do is not strengthening existing leaders and calling out new ones, we will eventually die. That's always been true, by the way. That was true 50 years ago. But the strongest and most vital churches, the kingdom-building churches, had a process of discipling that included calling out and strengthening New leaders. But it is especially true now. We must be more intentional about what we do and why we do it now than ever before. Rather than just repeating things. There's nothing wrong with repeating what works. But we need to evaluate. See, not many new folks are coming to us just because we open the door. Some do. But the fields out there, they still are white in the harvest, by the way, but most of the people out in those fields do not realize that. We've got to focus outwardly. We keep on focusing inwardly. We keep on loving each other. We keep nurturing what we have. That's strength. But we must focus outwardly. We must connect with people where they are. We must love them to death. So that Jesus can love them to life. And some people out there don't really want to be loved. But we must love them. We don't need to be a nuisance. But we need to keep on keeping on making connections out there. Out there. Out there. Yes, we keep on doing church here. Yes, we still have a great fellowship here. But we keep on connect, making connections out there. <coughs> Folks, that takes leaders. That takes leaders more than the pastor, the associate pastor, the deacons. They should be at the vanguard, the lead of that. They should be the models of that. But it takes more leaders than that. And we must have the courage to evaluate the effectiveness of what we're doing. And either strengthen what we're doing if it's working or stop doing what isn't working. We, and more than any other time in the church's history in America... We must have the courage to evaluate. That sounds threatening. It doesn't need to be threatening. The good news is we can do God's work well and still be three creeks. Hear that again. We can do God's work well. We can improve where improvement is needed and still be three creeks. And you know what I mean when I say three creeks. You get the whole picture of that. That's not my desire or any other person's desire, I think, to ever change the strength that you have, the goodness that you are. But we do need to evaluate how we are doing ministry, what we believe about our future, and what we do to prepare for it determines our future. What we believe about our future. And then what we do to prepare for it determines what will be. Now, certainly the Holy Spirit determines ultimately. But in talking in human terms, that is true. The church that circles its wagon always dies. The church that circles its wagons and says, you know, we're doing good enough. We can't just circle our wagons. Or we'll die. We've got to be on mission. More than just a term, more than just a slogan. Now when we speak of strengthening existing leaders, hear this now, and raising up new ones, we're not talking about removing someone from their existing ministry. That would be crazy. I'm not crazy. The transition team is not crazy. We're not interested in removing anybody from their existing ministry. The goal is to change, not to change leadership, but to share leadership. Get to see the difference? The goal is not to move anybody out from what they love doing and do it well. But to just encourage them, hey, why don't you share that with somebody else? 
if you're not already, and some are, of course. Well, in the Mark chapter 10 passage, Jesus taught two vital truths about leadership. Leadership for those who know Him and are a part of His kingdom. And the first thing, very simply, and we'll look at it in a moment, but the first thing I'm going to share with you is that leaders must not be afraid to define reality as it is. And many churches are afraid to really define reality as it really is, but leaders must do that. A pastor must do that, even if it's misunderstood, even if it makes us feel uncomfortable. He doesn't need to do that every time he preaches or talks to people or leads in a group. Thank goodness. But the real leaders that we really truly appreciate and really did move us and helped us, God worked through them because they defined reality as it truly exists, not how we would like to think that it exists. And then secondly, we'll look at leaders must first be followers, and they must always keep a follower's heart. I must always keep a follower's heart, and must, in a sense, always, with leadership, also be a follower to those who lead me in a direction that I need to hear and to follow. Let's think about those a little bit more. Leader, if you want to lead like Jesus... You, first of all, must lead with clarity, with clarity. In his book, Leadership as an Art, the late businessman Max Dupree made a statement that has now become like an axiom among leaders. You hear it all the time. And that axiom is this, quote, the first responsibility of a leader is to define reality. Leaders, we must lead with clarity and define reality. In our deacon body, in our Sunday school class, in our whatever organization in the church we are leading. Or having an influence. Define reality. Tell it like it is. And we don't like that because tell it like it is kind of sounds like in your face. That's not the spirit at all. It's not tell it like it is in a crass, carnal kind of way. But do not be afraid to say, you know, we could do better in this area. Why don't we? We can strengthen this area. What can we do? Let's talk about it. To do better in this area. Leaders define reality. They lead with clarity. And look at how Jesus did that in verse 33. Here's why I'm going back to this text again. He pulls the 12 aside as they're on their way up to Jerusalem. That is actually topography. They're actually going upwards to the height of Jerusalem. And notice what he says, verse 33. We are going up to Jerusalem. That in itself scares them. He said, no. That's what we're going to do. We're going up to Jerusalem. And here's what's going to happen. The Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and teachers of the law. Astounding to them. Although they had feared it all this time. I'm going to betray. That word betrayal strikes fear in their hearts and confusion. How can this be that anyone would betray you, Master? And not only that, then they will condemn him. And not only that, they'll condemn him to death. The Jewish leaders will. And then, not only that, they will hand him over to the Gentiles, to the Roman authorities. You see how it's just going down and down and down, but he is defining reality as it is. They will mock him. They will spit on him, the Messiah. They will flog him, scourge him, your Bible may say. And then they will kill him. And you can imagine 12 men with eyes as big as saucers hearing that. And sometimes they just have a hard time hearing the last sentence. Three days later, three days later, he will rise. But all these things are going to happen. In what ways do you personally, as a leader... And if you have influence, by the way, whether you have a position or not, if you have influence, and most of us have some influence, godly influence, in what ways do you need clarity about reality? Let me suggest a couple of things. First of all, clarity about the direction of your church. Clarity about the direction of Three Creeks Baptist Church. Direct, uh, clarity about the church's mission. It's a love-motivated, disciple-making mission. 
we said we want to love God supremely. Then we want to love people profoundly. Then we want fully devoted followers of all those who come in these walls and those outside as well. And see how one leads to the other. First of all, loving God supremely always must come first. Leader, are, are you bought in in your heart with that, that desire that you and your family, do you pray that in your homes, in your Sunday school classes, that we may simply love God supremely because that does not come naturally. It is the Spirit of God Himself who moves in our hearts that we may love God supremely. But when He does, the next thing happens. When you really get into love God, you really start loving people. I mean loving them. Loving the ones you really love and loving the ones you don't especially love. You love them all. You begin to love them more because the Spirit of God will put that in you. And if you have a hard time with this relationship and that relationship, it may be that you're not loving God. By the way, relationships are difficult at times. We understand that. When we love God supremely, then we love people profoundly. More than just a, I love you. And out of that then flows the hunger to see those we care about become really on board where Jesus is going. Fully devoted followers of Christ. That's easy to hear, but leader, I'm asking you, is that part of your reality? How about your church's mission? Your church's vision, that is. That's the mission. The vision, probably a little less familiar with that. We are operating in that vision right now. We have a two-year vision between now and two years from now. Next pastor comes, then he will be able to move along with that and then add his vision to it. That's why we're doing that. And right now, this first half of 2018, we are strengthening existing leaders and calling out new ones. That's why I'm preaching the way I'm preaching. I'm living out for you the vision that we need to have. It needs to be your vision. If you're a leader out there, you don't be saying, you know, I'm, I'm getting tired of hearing about leadership. No. Don't say that, sister. Don't say that, brother. God is at work. Not because I'm standing up here, but God is at work. And we need to strengthen our existing leadership. And call out new people. In the second half of this year, we want to create a step-by-step -step, step discipleship ministry. Step-by-step. Step. person comes in the door. They join the church. Here's the first step. But then we don't drop them there. We get them connected somewhere with a Sunday school class or some other discipleship ministry that we have. And then we take them to the next step that they may understand what the Bible says about Jesus, who He is. New Testament doctrine. They may have a clear understanding of that and specifically how we as Baptists understand that. And the next step is uh, the ways that we do church and why. The next step is them being involved, step-by-step -step discipleship. We move on into 2019, new member training for all ages. By the way, tonight uh, we will go further with adult new member training. I hope you'll come back. We take the next step in that. New member training for all ages to be led by lay people, ideally. By this time next year. By fall of next year, a focus on evangelism training and, ev and evangelism. Why are we not doing that now? Because we must have discipleship strengthened. We must, have the, we must not keep from doing evangelism. Don't misunderstand that. But that all-out push comes after we have put things in place. And here's where it gets personal. Do you support these things? Later, we're talking about clarity at the direction of your church. Defining reality as we need for it to be. Are you on board? I, I can't get you on board. You, you need to call upon the Spirit and say, Lord, show me if these things are good. Show me if they are. See, if you're not on board, if you're not on the bus, you say, you know, I'm really not sure if I'm on the bus or off the bus. You know, that's okay. That doesn't bother me. Pastor, I just got, you know, up to now, I just can't really resonate and go, wow, that's okay. As long as you're praying about it. If you have a place of influence, you are influencing others. I ask you, brother, sister, will you at least pray about this direction? The transition team 
has given to the church and you have already voted and said, yes, we approve of that vision. Do you really? Do you really? Be excited about it. Make suggestions. Come and tell us, you know, it really could be better if it were stated this way. There's nothing in this that's written in concrete. And by the way, let me just pause and say, be careful about, about putting things in concrete. I tell the transition team, just because it's in print, don't let it be in concrete. The Spirit sometimes corrects. There are other people who come and say, this would be better in this way. Good. Your next full-time pastor may come and say, I think this would be better if we shift this around. Great. The church of the 21st century must be flexible. We must move with the Spirit. And not hold on to saying, oh, no, no, we created that. We worked hard at that. It took us so many hours. We must be flexible. As a leader, you not only need clarity of the direction of your church, you also need clarity about your role, leader. Clarity about your role. What are you supposed to do and when and how are you supposed to do it? Oh, preacher, I know that. Some churches assume that everybody knows what their role is. And if you come up to them and say, we want you to serve in this area, they already, it clicks. Okay, I know exactly what you're talking about and what you're expecting of me. But I want to tell you that one hope of our transition team is that this year, most of our leaders, can't say all necessarily, that most of them will have the benefit of a written job description. When the nominating committee comes to the... important because it gives us a better idea what we are accountable for, what God expects of us. And we need to take that out and look at it occasionally and say, am I living up to this calling? You're not just filling a seat or standing behind a lectern or playing with the kids. It's a calling. Clarity about your role. When I visit the optometrist, uh, it's always interesting. I really enjoy my optometrist. He's a fun guy. But it's the same old routine. You know what I'm talking about. He puts this deal in front of me, and he starts off, and you read these letters, and they are fuzzy. It's kind of like, wow, this is not fun. But it gets to be fun as he starts moving that dial. Ah, okay, that is L-E-C-P-V-W. I get it now. And then he says, well, how about this? Is number one better or number two? Oh, man, number two is better. And finally, he says, this is it. This is the way you're going to see. It's clear. And it's uplifting. It's encouraging. So it is when we know our role. We also need leaders to be clear about God's view of our role, not just our own understanding, but God's view. See, all of us, all of us, from time to time, let's begin with the preacher. All of us should ask God His view of our role. Should get some time where we're by ourselves, quiet, and say, Spirit of God, speak to me. Spirit of God, tell me of anything that you want to see better tell me what I'm doing in the church if it pleases you or if it doesn't and then listen to what he says and do whatever he says write it down you'll forget the devil snap it out of your memory write it down and do it Henry Blackaby author of experiencing God is nothing less than a prophet when he says this, you can't stay where you are and go with God. I cannot stay with God if I say, well, I, this is the manner in which I prepared sermons. This is the manner in which I preach. You know, I do this. I go to this passage. I cannot go with God and just say, Lord, this is how I'm going to do it from now on. I expect your anointing, though, that no, no change is going to happen just by my words amplified over a speaker. No change. 
Not without an anointing of the Spirit. No change. So I must begin by saying, Spirit of God, change me. I don't care how long I've been doing this, what my age is, it doesn't matter. The fresh streams of fresh waters in the spiritual life are like none other. In Romans chapter 12, verse 1, Paul says we're to present ourselves as living sacrifices. By the way, the, the verb tense there is keep on doing this. Keep on coming back. Keep on presenting yourself as a living sacrifice. Holy and acceptable unto God. Which is our reasonable act of worship. And then it says to stop being conformed to the ways of this world. You know what that means? Same tense. Stop. Keep on stopping. To see, I, I move right back in conformity and I say, whoop, forgive me, Lord. I repent and I come back over here. And after a while, uh, it, is it just me? After a while, I have to say, whoop, I'm conforming to the world again. And I'm trying to be a leader. And you cannot do what you want to do in me. If I don't have clarity about my role and your strength. In addition to leading with clarity, a leader, secondly, must also first be a follower. Pastor needs to be a follower. Associate pastor needs to be a follower. All of us here who hear my voice, we all need, no matter what we do, deacons need to be followers. Because we look in verse 35, we know about James and John coming to Jesus. Lord, will you do for us whatever we ask? What do you want, he says. He says, we'd like to one of us sit on your right, and the other on your left when you come into your glory, which they think is next week. We want a positional place. Verse 38, the Lord says, you don't know what you're asking. You don't know what you're asking because with great authority always comes sacrifice. That is still true now. Whenever you want to move up in position, realize that's going to mean more sacrifice of your time and of your mind and of your focus. When God calls you, you need to go, but you need to understand that. It's not all glory. It's work. And they say flippantly, I think, verse 39, we can, we are able. Jesus says, well, you indeed will. And they did. They did suffer as he did. Not on the cross, all of them. Most of them not. But they did suffer for his name. Verse 41, we know, we've read this before, the ten become indignant. And Jesus' response in verse 42, he calls him together and he says, You know, those who regard as rulers of the Gentiles, the folks down at the city hall of Jerusalem, they lord it over them, the rest of us. The word lord it over them means they make things happen by use of threat. Sometimes a very veiled, subtle threat, but they, they make threats and people get in line. That's how they lead. So it's a subtle threat. They kind of get something going and, you know, if this doesn't change pretty soon, it's curtains for you and your role. And then he says their high officials exercise authority over them. That word exercise authority means they make, they, make, make things happen by position and title. I am the title. Therefore, it will be. I may not threaten you, but look at my title and my position. Therefore, you must obey me. That's the way it is in the world. Can I get an amen? That's the way it is. Not, not as badly, perhaps, as it was 30, 40 years ago. But there still is a lot of top-down authority in our places of work. Winston Churchill, in his book, Churchill on Leadership, said, Power... For the sake of lording it over fellow creatures or adding to personal pomp is rightly judged base. Power just for the sake of power, look who I am, look where I am now, is rightly, and he's talking about the secular world with a secular mind, even there, it's rightly judged base. Not so with you, he says in verse 43. Not so. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must become your diakonos. That's just somebody who enjoys serving. 
somebody enjoys serving is, who's really a servant, they don't have to have somebody see them. And they don't have to have a pat on the back every time because they are a servant. Some of us may have the gift of being a servant. All of us have the responsibility of being a servant. And if we give, we don't need to let everybody know what we give or be praised for that. Diakonos, verse 44, and whoever wants to be first, which people do, by the way, that isn't always evil just to want to, to shine. He understands human nature. They must be a doulos. A doulos, a slave, absolutely had no rights at all. No prestige at all. If you want to be first in his kingdom, that doesn't mean you mean to go around church, you know, uh, dragging your jaw. You need to sit up straight and enjoy life. Smile. But have the servant's heart. Even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom, a payment. For many. Gene Wilkes says that service implies labor without accolades. If you really get this, then you don't need a blue ribbon. You don't need stars in the Sunday school class. Nothing wrong with that. That was a good way to motivate kids. You don't have to have recognition up on the platform all the time. Service implies labor without Accolades. Everything rises and falls on leadership. But it really rises and falls on the leader whom we are following. People can come to church and sing the songs that anointed people have written and they're Filled with the Holy Spirit, hopefully, when they were written. And hopefully, the Spirit is working through our worship leaders. And we can follow along and singing those songs and have our minds a hundred miles away. And sing as if our hearts have repented. And go along with the crowd and say in our hearts and in our motions, yes, there has been a time when I have turned away from self being the rule and I have turned to Christ. I have received him into my, his, my heart as my Savior and Lord. I have forsaken the rule of sin in my life. I'm not saying I'm never a sinner, but the rule of sin in my life, I have forsaken that rule. And sometimes I need to forsake it again, but I have repented. Jesus does live in my life. Now, if that has not happened in your life, and I'm glad that you are here, I'm glad you're singing the songs with the rest of us who have had that experience, but I'm telling you, there's nothing like the experience. It's kind of like going and kicking tires on a car you want so badly, and you could get in and drive, but you say, no, I just kind of want to walk around and pretend. We invite you as this church to come alongside us as we follow Christ. Don't try to fake it. Repent. Humble yourself even today, even this moment. And let Christ change the direction of your life. And He will. Our Lord, we come... And thank you, Father, for the truth of the Bible. We believe in you, therefore we can thank you that involvement in the life of your body in the church and the kingdom at large, the, the bigger picture of the kingdom, is servanthood. If we were going to design it, it would not be servanthood. But we thank you, Lord, because you never fail. Your truths, your direction, there's always life bubbling in them. We pray, Father, that life will bubble in, now, in us now. We pray, Father, that whatever you say to us now about our spiritual walk or lack thereof, 
that we may respond to you now. Now is the time. For when we step out these doors, we realize, Lord, our eyes turn elsewhere. Oh, Father, be pleased to stir us. In Jesus' name, amen. Stand. We sing.